Adams uh, is going to give uh, the first of his lecture on the introduction to circular leaf. Thanks. Thanks so much for coming and for having me. I love being here. Um, the first half of this lecture is going to be isomorphic to the first half of Adam's lecture, but with a different accent. And, um, and then after that, the two courses are going to diverge radically. Uh, this is going to be sort of a combinatorial course. There's going to be very little dynamics, if any. Uh, so this is not usually how circular orderability is um, presented, uh, at least uh, in my experience. So I hope I don't offend any of the experts too much. Here we go. Let's see what happens. So. With, um, so you just saw an hour about left orderable group. And the way I like to think about left orderable groups is they're groups that you can put on a line. They're groups that you can order them in a line in such a way, if you have B and H where G is to the left of H, right? And then you multiply um, on the left by F, then, it does something to the group, but you know, if G, G is to the left of H, then FG is still to the left of FH. That's what it means to be left orderable. FG and so here is FH. Right? The order is preserved. Right. So circularly orderable groups are going to be groups you can put on a circle. That's the, that's the way I like to think about it. You draw a circle and you can put them on there. So let's start with, um, you know, the first group you see put on a circle. When you learn mathematics, I hope. Z mod seven Z, Z mod seven Z uh, with addition. Like, this is clock arithmetic. This is the thing that you're taught and you put it on a clock and a clock looks like a circle. Four, five, six, and this is a clock that you get. And it's on a circle, which is great. So here's my circle. In my circle, uh, let's go around in the direction you would hope. Uh, what's nice about this circle is that when I add anything to the circle, the circle just rotates, right? The order things go around the circle to stay in that order. So I can go like this and I can say, okay, two plus dot, right? And now my circle looks like two, three, four, five, six, zero, one. The order around the circle is preserved. Whatever order around the circle means, we'll get to that in a second. Great. But this isn't the only way I can put these elements on the circle. There's another way. I could also, I could do the following. I could say put zero there, and then I could choose my favorite generator. Mine is three, six, uh, two, Five, one, four, zero. Four. That was tough. Okay, and here's a perfectly good way to put on a circle, and it has uh, the similar property that I can add any element to it, and the order is going to be preserved around the circle. Here's another example: um, a circle. This better be a circularly orderable group, or uh, why we're we here. I'm going to think of this as the unit, uh, the unit vectors in C on the complex numbers with norm one. And here's a picture of it. And there's the identity. There, right? And multiplication, if you take the whole circle and you multiply it by a point here, right? This, this group is with multiplication, right? It's this set with multiplication. Complex multiplication and e to the i theta times your circle, where it's just rotation by theta. So the order is preserved around the circle. So this um, is rotation by theta. Rotation by theta. Cool. Okay. So let's try to formalize this, right? We want to have some kind of uh, some kind of combinatorial thing or something to check to say order around the circle is preserved, right? So the question now is what do we want, right? 
what do we mean? We mean by a circular ordering by an order on a circle, order on a circle. Your naive attempt might be, I start somewhere and I start going around clockwise, and then, you know, I have two elements, let's say G1 and G2. I start somewhere and I start going around clockwise and I say, I hit G1 first and then I hit G2. There's some kind of ordering there, but that's not good enough because you know, I might start here and if I go clockwise, I hit G1 and then G2. But if I start here and go clockwise, I'd hit G2 and then G1. So that's not going to be a, a good enough sort of heuristic. What you really, it turns out what we're going to need is to look at triples. Right? And now it's well defined to say, start somewhere on the circle and move around the circle and look at the order in which you hit the three elements, right? So here I go, I start here and I go, okay, I hit G1, G2, gen, then G3 in that order. And then you might say, but what if I start here? Well, it's just some cyclic permutation. So really what we're after is we want some function from our set, which is gonna be our group, triples on our set, to, I want to identify do they go clockwise or do they go counterclockwise? Do they go clockwise or counterclockwise? Which, because we lack imagination, we're going to call those plus one and minus one. So plus minus one. And then if two of your elements are the same, we don't want to talk about them going clockwise or counterclockwise. We just want to ignore them. So it's got to be some kind of map on the set of triples, and we want it to have some properties. So let me let's start writing down the definition and then we'll add to it as the properties become uh, apparent or desirable. We're going to define a circularly orderable group now. Let D be a group. A circular ordering on G is a function B from G cubed to zero plus or minus one. Satisfying. Okay, so the first one is going to be that what elements map to zero are exactly the ones where two of the elements, two of the elements in your triple coincide. So C inverse of zero is exactly all the elements G1, G2, G3, such that um, GI equals GJ to some I not equal to J. All right, now the second thing I want to write down. It's sort of, this has to capture, there's an order around the circle, right? We have to somehow turn that intuition into some, some condition here. Okay, so plus one, let's go back here. So plus one is gonna be, I go counterclockwise. And minus one is gonna be clockwise, uh, just for, this is the way I draw my pictures. So this is the convention I'm gonna enforce on you, if you like it or not. So on this picture here, G1, G2, G3, C of G1, G2, G3. Well, I start at G1 and then I go, which way do I have to go to hit G2, Gen, G3? So it's clockwise in this case. So this is gonna be minus one. But if I look at C of G2, G1, G3, G2, G1, G3 goes counterclockwise. We started G2 and then go G1, G3, that goes counterclockwise. So I want that to be plus one. Okay. So a little bit, I'm gonna move back and forth a bit. Sorry, um, Giacomo and everyone online. So this is hinting at some property that maybe I want from circular orderings is that the sign of the permutation matters. So if I take a, take a triple and I permute it by a even permutation, <laughs> yeah, I'll just stand on this. Okay. So if I take a triple and I permute it by an even permutation, I don't want the sign to change, right? A cyclic permutation shouldn't change the sign. But if I do a transposition, it should change the sign. Okay, so here's what we want. So we would like that 
C of G sigma of one. So I take some permutation sigma, sigma two, U of sigma three is equal to the sign of your permutation, C of G one, G two, G three. That's one thing maybe we would want. Uh, and another thing that maybe we would want is suppose you have a fourth point here. G1, G2, G3, let's say that's clockwise. So if you know G1, G2, G3 is clockwise and you know G3, G, sorry, G1, G3, G4 is clockwise, that forces G1, G2, G4 to be clockwise. If you draw out a picture and you try to, there's only one place you can put, um, so if you know that these three go clockwise and these three go clockwise, you're forced to have these three go clockwise. There's some kind of compatibility between fours. Yes, let me write that down and try not to mess it up. C of G1, G2, G3 equals C of 1, G3, G4 equals 1 implies C of G1, G2, G4 equals 1. Okay, so this is some kind of compatibility with the four points around the circle. And it turns out that these two conditions together are equivalent to the following thing I'm going to write down. That for all quadruples, for all G1, G2, G3, G4, and G. Uh, right over here, C of G. So it's an alternating sum over the triples where you leave out one of them at a time. Right, so here I've left out the G1. Now I'm going to subtract the thing where I leave out the G2 and add the thing where I leave out the G3 and subtract the thing where I leave out the G4. And you want that to be equal to zero. So it's an exercise to show that these two conditions are equivalent to that, this condition that I wrote down here. Uh, so the, the second one is no matter if it's repetition. It doesn't matter if it's repetition, that's right. You could have G1 and G2 being equal, that's fine. Okay, so somehow, I don't know, I. <laughs> I'm, I've seen this for a long time and never understood where it comes from. And then in the back of a book by, in the appendix of a book by Thomas uh, Kim, I believe, there's, a, there's an explanation of this equivalent, sort of saying, where does this condition come from? It comes from, well, you want these two conditions, and then if you want these, you're forced to have that. It's, an, it's a really nice explanation. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, right, so these two things I've written down there have nothing to do with G being a group. So that tells me G is what's called a circularly ordered set. And now I want to bring the group into it. So the third condition that I need is that for all um, H and G1, G2, G3, and G, if you multiply on the left, you don't change the circular ordering. That's the definition of what a circularly orderable group is. And just like the intuition I said at the beginning of the lecture for a left orderable group, you put it on a line that multiplication preserves, right? Here's the picture you have now. So I can put my group on a circle, G1, G2, G3, let's say. And then if I multiply by H on the left, it moves the whole circle so that any triple I should have a circle in blue. So that the order around the circle of any triple is preserved. So maybe here is where H G1 gets sent. Uh, G1, G2, G3 clockwise. Okay. H of G2 and here, H of G3. This is what this last condition is saying. 
first two conditions say you can actually draw the group on a circle. The last one says um, that order is preserved. Any questions? The order of the groups are by definition circular. Mm -hmm. order of they are, and I will um, get to that in a sec. But you're absolutely right. Left orderable groups are circularly orderable. If you're bored, try to prove that. So is, uh, uh, would you say surface groups are also orderable? Should, should we, should, is that the main example? It's sometimes? true, surface groups, uh, in fact, surface groups are bi-orderable, which implies left orderable, which implies circularly orderable. And you get that from the Gromov boundary, I guess, right? Is that? Uh, uh, I don't know if that's how you get the bi ordering. Uh, no, in fact, you act on the Gromov boundary, you won't get a left ordering, um, but you will get a circular ordering. But you're you're just like skipping miles ahead. <laughs> but you're right. You're absolutely right. So here's a fun fact that's going to be useful. It's going to come back a couple of times. So a circularly orderable set is where you just have one and two. Right, the first two properties without the group multiplication. So if S is a circularly orderable set um, and you take an element in your circularly orderable set, <clears throat> then if you look at, if you remove a point on your circle, the remaining is, is totally ordered as a set. Okay. Then this admits a total ordering ordering um, this given by um, T1 is less than T2 if C, S, T1, T2 equals one. Okay, so you can translate, if you remove a point, you can use that as sort of a reference point and you can translate the complement into a totally ordered set. And you can check the transitivity comes from this property here. Anything else that you would like? Oh, and I didn't say, sorry, I should have written it down here. A group is circularly orderable if it admits a circular ordering. It's the same, same language as left orderable, that kind of thing. Okay, so here is the first exercise. I will prove this in lecture two or three, but for now you can actually prove it just straight from the definition. Exercise, uh, so G, a finite group, then G is circularly orderable if and only if G is cyclic. It is the first exercise that maybe you'd want to try and do. Um, I'm going to give you sort of a bit of a hint to how this goes about. Everyone? Yes. I'm not sure that they see the oh, red. They can't see the red. Sorry. Yes, it says, I'm not going to write it again, but it says G is finite if and only if G is cyclic. So, uh, sorry. Yeah, so, <laughs> that's a false statement. Finite group, G is circularly orderable if and only if G is cyclic. Uh, so how does this, how does this kind of go, right? So you, you take your finite group and since it's circularly orderable, well, one direction is easy, right? If it's cyclic, there is a circular ordering. You take your finite group, here's the identity on your finite group, and you ignore it. Now, this is totally ordered. It's a finite, totally ordered set, so it has a minimal element, minimum. Yeah. Show that that's a generator. And that's how the proof goes. So you take the minimum of your totally ordered set obtained by getting rid of the identity and then show that that's a, a generator. It's a fun exercise for some definition of fun. As I said, I'll prove it um, a little later on with a bit more machinery. But for now, you can use that to fill any awkward silences at lunch. So here is another exercise to get things moving. Oh, so first, if you have a, this is not an exercise, we do it in white. Okay, you have a subgroup. So let's have a look at subgroups. It doesn't take too much imagination to see that if you have a subgroup of a circularly ordered, orderable group, you can restrict any circular ordering to the subgroup, and that's a circular ordering of the subgroup. So H, a subgroup of G, 
And G is circularly audible. It implies that H is circularly audible. And more generally, we have the following exercise that if you have an injection from a group, so you have an injection from H into G, um, and G is circularly audible. White is better. White is better? Okay. Yeah. Know that. All right, so you have an injection from G to H and G is circularly audible, then H, uh, sorry, let me state this as I want to do. And G comes with some circular order, right? So it's a circularly ordered group. It's a circularly. Then what I'm gonna write is I star C of H1, H2, H3, okay, which is, it's a circular ordering on H and how is it defined? You just put the group inside the bigger group and restrict the order from there, right? So this is C of iota H1, iota H2, iota H3. Um, is a circular ordering, circular ordering. So here are some corollaries of the exercises. The one is that circularly ordered. So if you take the rationals and you mod out by the integers and you take that direct product with Z mod N for any N, this is not circularly orderable because Inside here, there is a sub a finite cyclic subgroup of every order. So you'll have a subgroup which is not a finite subgroup of this, which is not cyclic, like Zn cross Zn, for example. Uh, and you will have a subgroup which is not circularly audible, so the big group can't be circularly audible. So this is not CO. Um, some other corollaries. So there are there are um, three of n. So this is the Euler phi function of n uh, ordering circular orderings on Z not n z. This exercise here about you take an injective map. So take an automorphism. So you've got phi of n many automorphisms of Z not n, and then you want to show that's all of them. Well, this exercise here, uh, during the proof, you will show that the smallest element has to be a generator. That tells you you can't have any other circular ordering. Here's a fun one. So I don't know if this was explicitly stated in Adam's course, but uh, it's, it's certainly true. With Z, there are two left orderings. We either have the positive cone be the positives or the negatives. Right. The exercise about injectivity actually tells us that there are uncountably many, are uncountably many circular orderings. How do we see this? So we consider, consider embeddings Z into S1. You can pick a generator of Z to be your favorite irrational rotation. And you have to do a little bit of work to show that any two distinct irrational rotations give rise to distinct circular orderings. And in fact, this is very closely related to the argument Adam gave about there being uncountably many distinct left orderings on Z cross Z. Okay, any questions? Yeah, maybe related to this uh, exercise, the fact that you have on the board, is there like a converse of this fact? Can you take a, a totally ordered, like a, a usual total order and do like a one point compactification or something and get a circular order? Uh, yes, we're gonna, that's the next thing I'm gonna say, more or less. So the question was, can you do like a one point compactification of a left ordering and turn it into a circle ordering? And that's exactly what you can do. And that was your question earlier as well. Uh, okay. So, so far, I've only given you abelian examples of circularly orderable groups. Let me give you a whole bunch more. 
and it's going to come exactly from the suggestion from the omnipresent voice in the room. So here's a proposition that um, if G is left orderable, then B is circularly orderable. So let's prove this. And the idea is, let me I'll do a little sketch up here of the idea. Oh, no, I won't. That'll be very confusing. Yeah, come on. Okay. So the proof sketch is there's a left orderable group. It's on a line. And here's me drawing it slightly differently. There's a left orderable group. It's on a line, except I sort of made it on a circle. That's the whole proof, except we write it down combinatorially. Um, so proof is let um, G1. G2, G3, and G be distinct. Fix a left ordering, a left ordering that. <laughs> then there is a permutation, sigma in S3, such that G1, G of sigma one, sorry, is less than G of sigma two is less than G of sigma three. We have three distinct elements on a left ordered group. One is the smallest one, and then the next one, and the next one. Whatever the permutation is that you need to apply to make that true, that's sigma. So then um, define B of G1 to G3 to be the sign of sigma. Sign of the permutation. And that does the job, and then you can check. The rest of the details are in X. That's with most things. So all our examples of left orderable groups are circularly orderable, although not in a very interesting way at this point. Free groups, surface groups that came out before, um, free products of left orderable groups will be shown to be left orderable. So we'll have those as well. Okay, good. What else is circularly orderable? Let's consider, put it over here. Let's consider some left orderable group. I don't know, F2. Let's consider F2. And the direct product of F2 with Z mod 4Z. I want to eventually show that this thing is circularly orderable. First, let's draw a picture to try and convince us that it is. So here is, let me go it up here. That's my picture of Z mod four. It with a circular ordering on it. It's around a circle like this. Here's the identity. And then maybe this, you know, this is one, two, three, zero, one, two, three, zero. Okay. The direct product of Z four and F two is at every point of Z mod four, there is a copy of F two, right? This is what it means to be a direct product. And F two is left orderable. This is great. Because now I can draw F two here with the ordering, and I can draw a copy of F2 here with the ordering, and a copy of F2 here with the ordering, a copy of F2 here with the ordering. And now I've put the whole group on a circle. It's more or less a circle. So let's turn this into the actual construction of what I'm about to do. So this is, this is more generally a lexicographic construction where you know, you've got a map from your group onto some circularly orderable group and the kernel is left orderable. Then you can draw this picture. So let's, let's write down the definition with this picture to guide us. So it's not as simple as the left orderable case where you have left orderable, left orderable, means the middle is left orderable. It's something a little more subtle here. So suppose you have K, uh, some group which is left ordered, a left ordered group. Uh, and H, and what I'm going to call C bar for reasons that will become clear, I hope. H and C bar, a circularly ordered group. And suppose you have a short exact sequence one to K to G to H to one. And I'm going to call this phi. The construction is going to be to circularly order G. And it's exactly this picture. We're going to use this picture to guide us. 
By the way, you hyphenate two worded adjectives. When they're adjectives. When they're adjectives. Thank you. The referees don't seem to know this, and it's infuriating. <laughs> well, let's write down this construction. Oh, but you don't if one of them is an adverb. If one of them is what, sorry? An adverb. Also circularly ordered. What? So you don't? You wouldn't hyphenate this? No, lies. <laughs> <laughs> that can't be true. Okay. But what if the referee is in the room? <laughs> <laughs> they probably are. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Think so. okay. Uh, okay, so let's define let's define a circular ordering. Define C on G as follows. Okay, so case one, you take three distinct things in G. If they map to three distinct things in H, that's just your circular ordering. You don't have to worry about that. Okay. So one. So if phi of G1 of uh, B, G2, uh, define this as follows. So D1, G2, G3, and G distinct. You don't need to define it on the ones where they're not because those are always zero. G3 are distinct. Then you simply define C of G1, G2, G3 to be C bar of phi of G1. Of G2. Okay, that's great. Now, if two of them, so let's say G1 and G2 get mapped to the same place, but they don't get mapped to the same place as G3. Okay, what does that mean on our picture? Is that let's say, so G1 and G2 sort of get mapped here and here. Let's say G1, G2, and maybe G3 gets mapped somewhere over here. But that's what's going on here. Well, you're going to translate these back into K. Use the left ordering on K. Figure out which one's on the left, which one's on the right. And then the third one. So this one's going to go, when I translate these back, I'm going to get G1, G2. And then wherever G3 ends up, it's going to be clockwise. Okay, so I'm using the left ordering on K to, give, to distinguish between where G1 and G2 go. All right. So then... Uh, G2 inverse G1 is in K. And you split it up into two cases. So um, G2 inverse G1 is less than the identity in K. Um, then you define C of G1 G2 G3 equals one. And if it's bigger, and then every other case where two of them coincide on the phi is just a permutation of this case. So you can use the permutation, the sign of the permutation to recover whatever C has to be here. Three, if they all are equal, equal. Um, so then we're gonna let, uh, just to ease notation, uh, A1 is going to be equal to G3 inverse G1. A2 is equal to G3 inverse G2. A3 is going to be the identity. Okay, what have I done? I just multiplied by G3 inverse to bring G1, G2, G3 back into K. That's my subgroup K. And now I've called them A1, A2, and A3, but really they just translate to G1, G2, and G3. So, and then again, now we're in K, so we can create the circular ordering coming from the left ordering of K. So there is a permutation sigma in S3, so that A of sigma one is less than A of sigma two, less than A of sigma three, and define uh, G, sorry, C, be the sign of that permutation. And then you check that this is a circular ordering. These are all exercises best done in private. 
<laughs> Keep it that way. So what this tells me is that if I have a short exact sequence where the quotient is circularly orderable, sorry, yeah, the quotient is circularly orderable and the kernel is left orderable, then this is circularly orderable. Allows us to again construct a bunch of, well, for example, F2 cross Z mode 4 Z is circularly orderable. There are torsion free examples of CO groups that are not LO. Yes. I'm not going to give you one right now. <laughs> um, there are three manifold groups which satisfy this property. A lot of three manifolds act on, uh, act on the circle, and you can get circular orderings that way. There's a group that's going to pop up in mine and Adam's lectures called the Promislav group, which basically is like do you have a question about left orderable and circularly orderable groups? You check there first, and it's probably a counterexample to something. Um, it's torsion free, it's not left orderable, it is circularly orderable. Okay, it's a great group. <laughs> Question What about the other? What about what do I mean by converse here? I start with a circularly orderable group and take a quotient. When is that circularly orderable? And this is this is a hard question. If, for example, Z cross Z mod three is CO, right? We just proved it. Modular checking all the details of the proof. But we constructed a potential circular ordering, which turns out to work. But this fits into a short exact sequence. It looks like this. Uh, Z cross Z mod three, Z mod three squared. Right, you can fit you can fit Z inside here as three Z, and then when you take the quotient, you get that. So here's a circularly orderable group. You're quotienting by a left orderable group, but you're not getting a circularly orderable group. But there are a, there is a, a a particular class of subgroups for which you can quotient by, uh, and I'm just going to draw the picture. So here's a circularly orderable group. There's the identity, and if you have a subgroup which behaves like that, okay. so it's convex, where right? you take, if you have two points, you have two points in the group and everything between them that contains the identity. It's also in the group, right? Then you can quotient and get a circularly orderable group. This is what's called a convex subgroup. Uh, surprisingly tricky, so you, you can write down a combinatorial definition for what it means for a subgroup to be convex. Uh, I'm not going to do it just because it's not sort of relevant to the rest of the course. Um, but it's a good exercise. So try your hand at trying to define what a convex subgroup is. Find a convex subgroup. Where, how do you like start? You draw this picture and you try to make a combinatorial definition. And it's riddled with traps. You try to do this. Um, there are attempts in the literature which are incorrect and in fact imply that subgroups are the whole group and things like this, uh, convex subgroups are the whole group. Like it's not, it's not obvious what you have to do. So try to try to write this down. Um, define convex subgroups and and prove right when when you have the right definition is when you prove the right theorems right and, the, and prove that the following theorem holds um, that if uh, GC right. GC is a circularly ordered group, circularly ordered, and um, H is convex. Let's let's say it's a normal subgroup is convex um, of index at least three. Then G mod H is circularly orderable with. A circular ordering that looks like this, right? C bar of G1 H, G2 H, G3 H is just equal to C of G1, G2, G3. Uh, question. Yes. Does anything go wrong if you try to define convexity by just, uh, you know, take a subgroup that is not everything, you remove a point, and then you use the total order on the left, on, on, on the rest? And then defining convexity of a total order seems pretty straightforward. It's really just everything between two elements has to be in the subgroup. Uh, sure, that's um, 
No, I don't think you'll have a problem there, actually. I don't think you'll have a problem there. It's a good suggestion. Uh, in fact, I think that's equivalent to the definition I have in my mind. So there are certain subgroups you can um, quotient by to get left orderable quotients induced by the left ordering on the big group. Can you tell us why you don't like index two subgroups? Because in order for me to define this circular ordering, I need at least three distinct elements in the quotient. Because if there's only two, then all C is just zero. Isn't that, so you don't think that, that Z2 is circularly ordered? No, I do. I do. That's fine. Um, it's just, you know, this becomes vacuously true. I should, you're right. It's not, it's not um, that interesting. Uh, so I guess that's why I didn't write it down. Is that I want to be able to have something interesting to say about C bar. Yeah. If you know that uh, in a in the quotient every finite subgroup is cyclic, is that enough to know that it's circularly ordered? No. Uh, so, uh, sorry, sorry. The quotient is that every finite subgroup is cyclic. Yeah. Is that enough to know that you're circularly ordered? How about D infinity? Yeah, D infinity, infinite dihedral group. Z one two subgroup there. Yeah. Dihedral bridge. Uh, is that a quotient? Is the, is the quotient in the... Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, free groups are circularly orderable. So, is your question whether the yeah, yeah, yeah. quotient is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, if I miss it, so you mean the infinite dihedral group is not circularly orderable? So, no, this is what I'm hesitating on saying. Sorry? Is the free product of circularly ordered? It's, yeah, okay, so it's, that's right. It's the free product Z2 star Z2, right? Yeah, yeah. so it's, it turns out the free products of circularly orderable groups are circularly orderable. Uh, so this thing is circularly orderable. Um, there must be a quick example. I'm struggling too. Yeah. Oh, the question? The question was, is it true that if you have a group, I mean, it wasn't a question, but it's a question I'm taking you to ask. <laughs> if you have a group where every finite subgroup is cyclic, is the group circularly ordered? Wouldn't it about quotients in the subgroup? Yeah, that's equivalent to my question because I was asking you that if it was a quotient of a circularly ordered group, you'd bring it to circularly ordered. So, yeah. Um, I can't come up with it. feels false. It feels totally false. Version free groups yeah. that are not that are not yeah free. okay yes that's true right so take one okay yeah they're torsion free <laughs> thanks uh and then i guess you could yeah you can just if you want a non-trivial finite subgroup you could take a direct sum with z13 it would still not be secularly audible okay yeah that's why it's not true <laughs> these questions are riddled with Perhaps. All right. So what I'll finish with is an analog of what Adam proved, which is that if you have a automorphism group of a left or of a totally ordered set, that's a left orderable group. And it's going to be true for circularly ordered sets. So um, suppose S is a circularly ordered set, and then the automorphism group of S is just going to be is a group of bijections preserving the circular ordering. It's a group of bijections of S preserving circular ordering. Pick a point in S. <laughs> you can fit this, uh, the um, automorphism group into a short exact sequence. You can look at the stabilizer of S, right? And here, this is not strictly going to be a short exact sequence of groups, but I'm going to be a little sloppy. Stabilizer of little s, this is ought s. This is really what's going on here is that this, this is just about never normal. But what I'm looking at here is this is just a set of cosets. There's going to be some circular ordering on it and an action by ought s on the set of cosets which preserves the circular ordering. Now, over here, if you're stabilizing S, you're acting on the complement, which is a left ordered, well, a totally ordered set. So this is um, automorphisms of 
automorphisms of S without little s. So this is LO. So this is left orderable. And this just looks like the orbit. Orbit of S. So it's like orbit stabilizer souped up a little bit. And the orbit of S is just some subset of a circularly ordered set. You can imitate the lexicographic construction. Let's circularly order this lexicographically CO. So if you have, so you can you, you can um you can hijack Adam's result, well the result that Adam spoke about to show that automorphisms of circularly orderable sets are circularly orderable. And this allows you to conclude that the following groups are circularly orderable. Homeo plus of S1. So homeo orientation preserving homeomorphisms of the circle. This is circularly audible. CO, BSL2R, orientation preserving isometries of H2. These act on the circle at infinity. Is CO. And as soon as you have this, then you have all your Fuchsian groups. So your surface groups, your orientable two orbifold groups. Surface groups, uh, free groups, right? The triangle groups, hyperbolic triangle groups, anyway, if you know what these are, um, et cetera, et cetera. These are all, are all circularly orderable, which maybe gives you a nice, a neat little combinatorial proof that all finite subgroups of a Fuchsian group are cyclic, the usual way that these go about, but that's what's going on here. So by triangle group, you don't mean the Coxeter group, you mean the... I mean, the index two orientable, what is sometimes called as a, the Von Dick group, maybe, yeah. I mean, the orientable index two subgroup of the triangle group, sorry. Yeah. Thank you, Ellie. Okay. Cool. So I'll just state, uh, I'm just out of time. Um, something that I'm not going to talk about is that free products of circularly orderable groups are circularly orderable. Um, this, I believe, is true to... Harry Bayek and Eric Samperton, um, and some amalgamated free products, but not all, are circularly orderable. Uh, you can have fun trying to prove these. Uh, uh, I believe that there is a way to go about proving these kinds of results by acting on the bass tree, which maybe Steve knows what's going on with this, uh, which paints a very nice picture and sort of imitates this Fuchsian group thing, right? Because What's happening here is you're acting on some boundary at infinity, and it's the same sort of thing should be happening if you take a free product of circularly orderable groups and act on the best search. Circularly order the boundary at infinity. General extensions are hard. It's an open problem. Here's the following open problem, which I'll finish with. And uh, it's kind of infuriating. So question, B and H are C, O, when is G cross H? C. <laughs> That'd be great. Okay. Are there any questions? Does every circular orderable group have a like a central extension by Z, which is left orderable? Yeah, yeah. That's next lecture. That's the whole of next lecture. Yeah. That's exactly what's gonna happen. Yeah. Great. Okay. Intuition is spot on. I mean, I don't know how Normal? Why are you writing? Sorry, what's the stabilization of point? Is it a normal subject? No, it's not normal. So, I, okay, if I'm being perfectly precise, and I wasn't, these are actually, this is a short exact sequence of G sets where G is odd S. So it's, it's, these are all sets on which odd S acts. And now it turns out that, so odd S acts on this set. This is a set of cosets. There's a circular ordering you can put on this and odd, X, odd S acts on it by order preserving automorphisms. You can play exactly the same game with the lexicographic construction to circularly order this group. <laughs> so basically the stabilizer is convex, no? In that. Sorry? Stabilizer is convex. Yes. Definition. The stabilizer will be convex. And in fact, in the lexicographic construction in general, the stabilizer, sorry, the kernel is a convex subgroup of the lexicographic ordering that you put on that group in the middle. Uh, I have a I have a stupid question actually. Um, I, I missed something you said. Why why is the how can we think of step s as r s minus s? 
sorry, what was the question? How can we think of step S as odd S minus S? The very first thing you have in the left oh, exact sequence. Yeah. This one. This one's yes, 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 yeah. yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so if you take a so you take a circularly ordered set, right? And now you're looking at all the automorphisms that fix a particular point. So it's going to be a set of automorphisms from the complement to itself. And the complement is left ordered. Is that right? So if you I see, I see, I see, I see. Yeah. That makes sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Stabilizer is a subgroup of odd of the complement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry, this is this is not supposed to be an inclusion. I'm just sort of labeling it and saying how you should think about it. Is that the stabilizer of S is the automorphisms of this as a as a totally ordered set coming from the circular ordering. Am I saying something wrong, really? Is this... Well, it certainly it acts. So there's an arrow from stab S into the other thing, but you might imagine this this totally ordered set has more automorphism than, I don't know, maybe it doesn't. The confusion is just you're saying they all yeah. something. OK. I don't, I don't think it does because the, the left the total ordering comes from your circular ordering. But maybe I'm missing something. I always get nervous when you tell me I'm wrong because you're always right. <laughs> Is circularly biorderable a meaningful thing? Right. It's a good question. Uh, it's not really going to come up in this course, but you can define circularly biorderable, which means you're invariant from the left and right. Um, there's a theorem. Uh, I don't know who it's by off the top of my head. I should have written this down anticipating this question. So theorem is that uh, if G is bicircularly orderable, what that means, then uh, G embeds, right? <laughs> if S1 cross L, where L is a biorderable group. So it sort of greatly simplifies the picture. That all this interesting circular orderability happens in S1. Um, order embeds too. It order embeds, right? You use like Lex order. Then. Right. This is lexicographically ordered. Right. Ordered. And this is an order embedding. But, but it's not true that if G is discrete and uh, bi orderable, then it embeds in Omeo plus S1. Uh, if G is discrete, like it's like it's I don't countable. Know. That's true. Oh, that's true. Yeah. So, so plus S one is G universal. Yeah. Just like homeo plus R is. Um, I see. That's correct. So, and do we have a conjecture for uh, the fundamental group of a three manifold to be cyclically or cyclically or Um Adam and Adressa wrote a paper about this very recently about what you can say about circular orderability of three manifold groups and what you can say about the manifold. Um, you can answer. It ends up being that, uh, you know, the L-space conjecture dictates when it's supposed to be left orderable. Yeah, if circular orderable ends up being basically the L-space conjecture up to finite cyclic covers. So if it's circularly orderable, it has to have a finite cyclic cover that's left orderable. Finite. So like a finite index. Like normal. Regular code. Yeah, yeah. So a finite index normal subgroup that's left orderable is when three manifold groups end up being circularly orderable. Much. <laughs>